Does anyone remember the first time they saw, or rather, heard a parrot? Well, I do. I was at a zoo with my dad, and I was around five. So you can imagine my astonishment when suddenly, out of nowhere, the parrot talked. Surely my dad had to be just as surprised as I was. I looked over at him. Nothing. Dad, that bird can talk. But he was quick to dismiss my excitement. He explained that there wasn't any actual meaning behind the parrot's words, and that it was merely imitating the sounds from its environment. Naturally, I was disappointed. <laughs> After all, where was the creativity and authenticity in imitation? But is this copycat behavior restricted solely to parrots? Or are we, as humans, also imitators of our environment? Hi, my name is Craig Daw, and today I'll be discussing inauthentic individuality and its implications. I'd like to introduce to you a concept I call existential lethargy. Sounds pretentious, right? Well, let me explain. Existential refers to the philosophy of existentialism, a philosophy that emphasizes the value of free will in determining one's own personal development and meaning. It began in the 1800s thanks to the work of Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who was dismayed at the lack of individuality he observed in those around him. He states that in a large group of people, one dares not believe in himself, finds being himself too risky, and finds it, far, finds it much easier and safer to be like the others, to become a copy, a number, along with the crowd. But what does this have to do with lethargy? Well, let's look at English author Virginia Woolf and what she had to say. She states that once you conform, a lethargy steals over all the finer nerves and faculties of the soul. You become all outward show and inward emptiness, dull, callous, and indifferent. In summary, existential lethargy is the idea that humans are simply too lazy and fearful to consistently act and think for themselves. This results in a life of wasted potential and metaphysical apathy. But how widespread is this existential lethargy? Let's turn to psychology. In psychology, existential lethargy is perhaps best exemplified by the concept of social proof. What is social proof? Well, author and researcher Rolf de Belli describes social proof as follows. The more people display a certain behavior, the more appropriate this behavior is judged to be by others. And in some of the most frightening chapters of human history, social proof is on full display. World War II. Joseph Goebbels is giving his infamous 1943 total war speech. And in this speech, he asks the German people if they are willing to stick with Hitler through thick and thin. Now, Goebbels has carefully selected his audience for this event, so naturally, the line is met with a thunderous applause. But that's not what matters. What matters is that the illusion of vehement, widespread Nazi support has been created for all the other Germans listening in at home on the radio. And because pro-Hitler sentiment in this situation is deemed to be popular, it is also deemed to be appropriate. This doesn't end with propaganda techniques, though. In fact, you see this strategy present even in modern-day sitcoms through the use of applause tracks. In fact, it's one of the few valid explanations for why this somehow lasted 12 seasons. <laughs> I'm serious, because according to Robert Provine, a Maryland University psychology professor, the necessary stimulus for laughter is not a joke, but another person. Furthermore, one 2002 study showed that participants consistently found content funnier when others were laughing with them. This trend continues, so if you do find that funny, just know that it's not entirely your fault. This trend continues into the world of social media with Instagram. 
In 2016, a study conducted at UCLA showed that when teenagers were shown photos with a lot of likes, their brains lit up. Parts of the brain associated with reward processing, attention, and imitation were all activated, and ultimately, the teenager was more likely to like the photo themselves. By contrast, when they were shown a photo without many likes, none of these effects were observed, regardless of how interesting the actual photo was. And social media in general can have a profound impact on teenage lives. In fact, one, one um, survey conducted by CBS showed that 75% of teenagers who observed other peers drinking or smoking online were more motivated and more likely to do the same. The common trend here is that we rely on external factors in order to influence our internal decisions. We're lazy. In all of us, there exists an inherent tendency to gravitate towards what is commonly accepted. To resist this gravitational pull is incredibly difficult, but it's vital. For if we don't, what follows is a life that is stagnant and an existence that is unremarkable. I'd like to return to Soren Kierkegaard and two more of his quotes that I'd like to highlight. First, the notion that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. And two, the idea that the greater the anxiety, the greater the man. Because according to Kierkegaard, there is an inevitable uneasiness associated with exercising free will, with confronting the unfamiliar, with going against the norm, with being in control of one's own purpose and meaning through decision making. But this is nothing to shy away from, because this uneasiness, this anxiety, is the very thing that makes us human, that makes our lives worth living. It's a side effect to individuality. By no means am I advocating for complete and constant rebellion. I'm merely asking that, whenever possible, you embrace this anxiety, that you rely more on contemplation as opposed to popularity, that you opt for existential proactivity over existential lethargy, that you take pride in your own individuality. Because, after all, where is the creativity and authenticity in imitation? Thank you.